Hi guys, my name is Charles. I'm one of the surgeons at South Coast. Today um, we are operating on a large um, Irish wolfhound cross that has a fibrosarcoma of the zygomatic arch right here. And you can see the CT scan in the corner there. Um, and uh, so that's uh, right where it is now. You can see that where that mass is on the zygomatic arch and then it's attaching to the infraorbital region of the maxilla. Um, and so we're going to remove a portion of the zygomatic arch and then also part of the maxilla here in order to get a clean margin on it. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to our channel. Make sure you turn on notifications so that you'll get a ding on your phone the next time we live stream. Hope everybody's having a nice holiday season um, and hopefully getting some time off. Um, I've had a bit of time off and I've really enjoyed it. Um, so... Anyway, we'll go ahead and get started. So the mass extends all the way back to here in the zygomatic arch, and so we're gonna to have to go quite a bit caudal to it because as we know, facial fibrosarcomas tend to be quite invasive, have a high chance of local recurrence. Um, so we've got a biopsy scar right here that I need to make sure that I exclude with my incision, although we don't need to get a, a, a wide soft tissue margin otherwise. And then we have to figure out what we're gonna do with the inside of the mouth here and whether I'm gonna take out this portion of the maxilla where the molar teeth are um, uh, in, embedded. So start my incision here, extend that caudally, and then I'm gonna make an ellipse out of the incision right over where the biopsy track is because that biopsy track is contaminated. If you leave it in, you're very likely to get recurrence. And I know that somebody's gonna ask me whether we're gonna take the eye out, and the answer is we are not, generally with these guys, although the zygomatic arch is responsible for protection of the eye to some degree. Um, I routinely leave the eye in on these patients. Now there's a chance that will damage the facial nerve. Um, and I can see the dog blinking as I cauterize in that region. So um, but damage to the facial nerve in that area should not cause any problem uh, in a dog that's not um, like brachycephalic. Get some Gelpy retractors in here and try to start spreading this open. Uh, maybe some nets and bobs. Thanks. And the skin on the side of the face is quite tough. And so I'm battling between going deep enough that I'll be able to incise it with mets and bones and not going so deeply that I cut into the tumor. So it's a little bit of a compromise there. Can I get some more mets please? These are dull. Jeff is our guest surgeon today. <laughs> guest surgeon. Fine one's good, yeah. Uh, quick question about if the, uh, the change is associated with a, um, it might be intro associated with a cancer or trauma? Yeah, so this is a fibrosarcoma um, on the side of the face of this dog. Getting through platysma muscle here. 
see if these scissors look better. They're still not great. Maybe it's just the tissue is so tough. Yeah. Yeah. We have a branch of the facial vein up here that we're going to encounter. Be a bit of a puzzle getting into these guys, especially on the medial orbit. It can be tricky to figure out what to do and where to cut and stuff because there are several different planes of bone. in here and try to open, open things up a little bit. We're just taking things slowly. My facial nerve or palpebral branch of the facial nerve is going to be right up in here. I might be able to preserve it. I think it's right there. I'm getting down to the zygomatic ligament right there that makes the kind of the lateral margin of the orbit attaches the um, zygomatic arch to the frontal region. So you can feel that. You want to feel that? Right there. Yeah. I'm getting down to the Zygomatic arch right here. And we've got the masseter muscle underneath it. I'm trying to get a little bit of a soft tissue margin at least. Your methods to getting my attention just hands up. <laughs> got Kath next door to us doing a TPLO. I can hear the saw going. And we've got a big window. We're very lucky to have a big window in our surgery suites. Or the wall, the wall is basically a big window, so we can see what everybody else is doing. ventral aspect of the zygomatic arch into the orbit down here. Question about the prognosis of this case post-removal? So the prognosis, as long as we get a clean margin on it, is quite good. The metastatic rate with fi uh, facial fibrosarcoma and fibrosarcomas in general is about 20%. Um, and this did come back a lower grade tumor. So that makes the risk of metastasis lower. Although facial fibrosarcomas tend to be a little bit more aggressive than fibrosarcomas that occur in other locations. And interestingly, histologically, they look quite benign, but they can be aggressive biologically. That was described by a medical oncologist named Phyllis Seacott at Colorado State University. And so we used to affectionately call these cicotomas. <laughs> um, if I can get something in here to try to spread those tissue planes apart a little bit. Thank you.
You're going to want to be careful not to go too deep so that I don't penetrate into the tumor. For those of you joining us late, this is a fibrosarcoma in the zygomatic arch of a dog. We're doing a wide local excision, including removal, so it's a partial orbitectomy, partial maxillectomy. Uh, this guy. I've got that facial vein sit sitting right here. Doing a ligature through that. See how Jeff double cauterized and then ligated. So that's a nerve there that's going to be a branch of the facial nerve, I think. I'm coming up that way. And we can transect that without any problems. Got a nuts and bone. If I recall correctly, I think facial nerve is not sensory, it's just motor. Yeah, try to have it on sensory. Yeah. And that brings in a question about if the facial nerve is damaged, will the face become paralyzed? Uh, yeah, so the facial nerve can certainly become paralyzed, but that doesn't cause any clinical problem. And it's only going to be from kind of a yeah. portal maxilla forward. Assuming if you're keeping the eye intact, follow-up RT will not be pursued? Uh, follow-up RT should not be necessary as long as we get a clean margin on it. And I don't mind leaving the eye in. We commonly irradiate patients with the eye close to the field, if not in the field. And we've never had to enucleate um, a dog due to side effects like cataract formation or retinitis or anything like that. So I don't, I don't mind leaving the eye in. You can always take it out later if you have to. So I'm coming up on top of the tumor here and getting into the medial orbit. That's the globe right there. And something pushing down. Yeah, probably a small um, malleable. Mm -hmm. And Early on in these surgeries, I like to be really slow and meticulous, trying to preserve blood supply and being aware of my anatomy and stuff. I know that things can get crazy a little bit later and then we have to be, you know, operate in a more hurried fashion. But while I can, I like to take it really slowly. So that's getting back into that zygomatic ligament. It's masseter muscle down there. So that's the zygomatic ligament that I'm cutting through right there. What's up? She was just asking if she could pretty easy to have the computer while doing it, but I said it was shut up on the screen. Yeah. I think. 
dissect back a little bit further here. So we've got the zygomatic arch exposed there nicely. All right, so I might go ahead and cut through that. Let's get a couple of homens in there. Um, dissect a little bit further quarterly. Gumpy a little bit farther back here as well. I'll just get Jeff to retract that caudal. So you can see the zygomatic arch right here. And then... Question about uh, how far the os uh, osteotomy <laughs> margin should be. Uh, with fibrosarcomas, I like to get a couple of centimeters margin. Um, because they are pretty invasive on the face, particularly. Okay, so I've got a couple of Hohmann retractors here. And I'm just going to make, and, and because this is fairly non-functional now that we're cutting through it, there's no reason to preserve any of it, really. So I'm just going to come quite far back here. as long as you don't get into the temporomandibular joint, which is at the caudal end. Okay, so that's through there. We'll find a lot of times that when you've got a tumor, the integrity of the bone is compromised. And so it can become quite wobbly. So just leave that in here. Viewers from Texas and Louisiana. Nice. Where else are our viewers watching from? Let me know where you are. Minnesota. It's about that time, late afternoon, early evening. So I'll just keep that packed off there. So I've released it up here. I'll just cut through that a little bit more, up through the zygomatic ligament. Okay, and so that's getting into the orbit there. You can start seeing some periorbital fat. So that's globe right there. That's the maxillary bone there. So I'm gonna start, I think I'm gonna start dissecting it there. Jeff, do you wanna switch sides with me, please? Yeah, sure. So Jeff to hold on to this home in here, up over the top of the nasal bone. My head's probably going to get in the way here. Uh, will the eye drop a bit after the arch uh, Yes, but not not perceptibly. Like you might see a little bit of a drop, and if if it was a human, you might have like double vision or something. But obviously, that's not something that we need to worry about too much with dogs. So, what is that there? That's where the medial canthus. Feel how attached the medial campus is. The soft yeah. tissue is attached to the skull. Um, and will the vision be affected? Uh, so we might get double vision. I don't know how we could tell. We couldn't read the newspaper anymore. <laughs> Switch back. Sorry. Some of the 
Uh, about 10, I think, isn't he? Six. Okay. So that's the conjunctiva right there from the inside. I really like surgical oncology because you see things from directions that you're not used to seeing them and so you have to really get used to three-dimensional three interpretation of the anatomy. That's the facial vein, facial vein, yeah. The skin in this area is so tightly adhered to the skull. Grab another El Paso, Texas, I see up there. Mm -hmm. Ontario, Brazil, Florida. Nice. All right, so. So that's infraorbital nerve sitting right there, that bundle. And that'll be sacrificed. Uh, a minute to dissect that out a little bit more. Italy, see what I have in England. Nice. Maybe you should find something better to do with your time. <laughs> So that's the infraorbital nerve bundle right in here. Can we get some of the please? So that's the infraorbital nerve bundle right here. Yeah. And so I'll inject that with the pivocaine before I cut it. So that's the palpebral fissure right there. So that's conjunctiva right in there. And that's the whole optic cone with all the extraocular musculature. into the oral cavity here, I think we will. So this is gonna be oral cavity right here. 
so we'll cut through that so that we can get exposure to the inside of the mouth. We can do that right now. We're waiting. If you guys can see the teeth there. So Jeff is just yes, injecting sir. into the infraorbital nerve before we cut it. Go ahead and transect that. We don't have any choice. Um, I don't mind cauterizing it. So that's, um, that's a good point, and that's raised an issue. There was a publication at, us, again, CSU, where they did a combined intraoral and dorsolateral approach for the combined orbitectomy, partial maxillectomy in dogs, and found that they gave them good exposure. I've just never really felt like I needed that. And if you look at the exposure that we've got here, it's pretty good. We may have to do a little bit of an intraoral component. Vessel here. Uh, another question. Um, any important steps uh, before transecting nerves besides the anesthetic infiltration? Uh, well, mainly make sure that they're that they're you can sacrifice them. <laughs> that making sure that they're not something critical and important, and then um, and then just infiltrating with mepivacaine, and often. As we're aware, um, nerve bundles travel with vessels, and so just be aware that when you cut them, you could get into some bleeding as well. So we're getting into the orbital salivary glands in here. Phygomatic? Mm. Yeah, less commonly uh, cause of silo cell. Yeah. Okay, so I'll just pack this underneath here. And then eventually we're gonna to have to get to the point that we don't have any choice but to start cutting the bone of the maxilla and the nasal bone, which is a little bit scary because you're cutting blind. And so I like to expose as much as I can. Who asked the question about the combined oral? That was a Stan Bateson. Huh. Stan must be a surgeon or a resident or something that studied it because it's not a, a widely known approach. And there was a question about uh, why reassuring nerves is a bad idea. Um, I imagine that it would cause pain. I end up doing it sometimes. Um, all right, so I'm gonna have to. So that's that, that medial campus right there. 
I'm just trying to expose the bone a little bit so I get a little better margin. This dog may have epiphora going forward because we probably are going to damage the nasolacrimal dust. All right, so I think I'm to the point where I can't avoid it any longer. <laughs> and I'm going to have to actually start cutting some bone here. Just try to reflect some of this out of the way. Probably get rid of that guy there. And we might move this scalpy retractor. Down here. All right, so I'm gonna have to go all the way around here. So we've got in here. For a yank our suction tip, we've lost our yeah, suction line. Inside. Because we're getting into nasal mucosa, we're going to start getting into some more significant bleeding here. And it really won't stop until you get the whole thing out. up like this a little bit. Uh, I wonder if we can get a, can we get a bigger Hellman? This becomes less elegant. <laughs> question about whether the rostral orbitectomy is going to include premolar 3, and I'm not sure until I get in there. Um, just give me some counter pressure. Now, I'm not going to be answering any questions for a little while here.
That's the palatine artery there. Just pack that off. We don't want it to break off. I think all that's left is the medial to the molars. Can I get a bigger ostrich cone, please? I come around that side. Which places of the future? Make sure I'm all the way through up here. Right, let's see what you got. Uh, the middle one, please. It's also possible that the dorsal nasal bone just keeps sucking in there for me, please. Side again. Please get a bigger mallet.
Uh, we probably I'll take that, but we've got a we've got some big orthopedic mallets. Got that big time in So that's out there, and that's all the inside of the nasal cavity. Piece of cake. Gel foam, please. A big thing of gel foam. Now that's good. We've got a combined calf intraoral yep. component and then nasal bone, medial orbit. It'll pull that out. Um, medial orbit and then zygomatic arch. And then that's the globe there. Yep. Awesome. Good. Colorize the vent. Somebody just said, I'm going to refer these. <laughs> Good. Good idea. <laughs> Good idea. Yeah, they get kind of hairy in there when you're in the middle of them. I'm just bleeding from the nasal cavity now. Yeah. yeah. A bit from the palatine. Just this in here. All right, thanks, Kath. Kath referred me this case. She saw it originally and then decided to have me do it. All right, so we'll 
look inside here, get some idea what's going to be involved in the closure. Uh, should not be affected. It'll, it'll have a congested nose for a little while, um, but that's it. It's quite, quite lateral. Yeah, yeah. We've only affected probably about twenty-five percent of the width of the nasal cavity. All right. So. Um, can I get some OPDS, please? There's a question from Stan about uh, whether or not you'd ever perform intraoperative x-rays of the resected area to see if margins of the um, so that's a good question. We used to do that routinely at CSU, not intraoperatively, but we would take um, the sample that we took out afterward and radiograph it just to make sure that there wasn't tumor approaching any of our margins. Probably not a bad idea. I feel pretty confident with what we've done, that we've gotten everything out. So now I'm just going to do a simple interrupted closure of the mucosa. Uh, question about the uh, expected recovery time post this kind of surgery. Uh, so this dog should be eating tonight. We'll put in a mepivacaine. Um, both, uh, cut both of them, please. Mepivacaine um, kind of a soaker catheter, which will really help with pain relief. to close these from the inside because then you don't have knots inside the mouth. As far as blood loss is concerned? Yeah. How much is in the bucket? Sorry, how much is in the in the suction bucket? Uh, 275 in total. Okay. Um, and we've got our sponges uh, at least yeah so 250 in the bucket and then we've got probably four lap sponges so that's another 200 what's uh, how much does that weigh 45 so it's blood volume is about 3 liters ish 2.8 to 3 We've lost four, it's about 14%. Four, four out of 28 would be one seven, which is 14%, right? So 14% of the blood volume, which is fine. We're replacing. We estimate that he's got a little bit more blood, maybe 10 to 14%. Yeah. So blood pressure dropped a little bit from probably from the blood loss and then we had given it a dose of alfaxan during the surgery. Um, and so we have given a fluid bolus and we've stopped the blood loss and the blood pressure is coming up now. So that's good. Question about uh, how many of these have you performed previously? I've probably done about, of this exact surgery, probably about 30, something like that. I've done it's not a super common one. 
Now I've done caudal maxillectomies and a lot more, um, but the combined orbitectomy caudal maxillectomy would be about that number. Coming from this direction may be easier. And this would be up there on the degree of difficulty as far as maxillofacial surgery is concerned. Can we get some, is that in the pivot kind there? Yes. Great. Some more. Uh, more, oh, yeah. We get some more RPS, please. Can cut place for it. Thanks, Miranda. Number. They haven't even done 30 for taloxation. <laughs> I've been fortunate enough to work in busy practices, so we've Gotten a lot of experience doing a lot of different types of surgery. Good judgment comes from experience. Experience comes from poor judgment. I've got a lot of experience. <laughs> so somebody's asking about the wound soaker catheter. Basically what we do is we put in a Jackson Pratt drain in here and then we use it not only for suction, although we can't really use suction in this area because it's open to the nasal cavity, um, but then we use it to infuse um, mepivacaine in every four hours. Really significantly contributes to pain control. Um, can you let Tegan know that I'm pretty much finished with this. surgery we'd perform would be? Probably a TPLO for cruciate disease or a spinal. And if you collectively look at all mass removals, we do a lot of them. Those would probably be the most common, wouldn't you say, Joe? Yeah. TPLOs, commonly we do six seven a week. Would you say that's fair? Yeah, close to. We're usually doing at least one a day. The spines, I'd say, one every second. 
Can I get a wire driver and an 062 pin? Yeah. Gonna put in the wire collet. It's gonna drill a little hole right there to anchor some tissue up over that tooth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's a pre molar so you should be able to go right between, if you wanted to, right between the roots. Yeah. Um, another question, what's the maximum blood volume a pet can safely lose? 20% uh, you can just do fluid replacement, uh, as in uh, crystalloid fluids. 30% you have to start thinking about blood transfusion. 40% um, you have to start thinking about pretty significant resuscitative measures and 50% is often fatal. Also depends on the rate at which they lost the blood. So if you lose it acutely, um, that's a lot, a lot harder, a lot worse physiologically than if you lose it chronically. So I'm just loosening up this tissue here so that we don't have as much tension on the gingiva that's closed over the maxilla. Uh, and one other question about uh, why I use bupivacaine over the bupivacaine? Um, bupivacaine now I think just comes in single dose vials, whereas mepivacaine comes in a bottle, so it really comes down to convenience and expense. I don't think we've been able to get bupivacaine for a little while, so at least we haven't got it in for a little while. So I'm just infusing the pivacaine in here right now. We do have um, rapivacaine in stock. Rapivacaine is just longer lasting, is that correct? It's on par with pivacaine. Okay. Um, can we get a Jackson Pratt, please? Yeah. So Jeff, mm -hmm. just drill a little hole right here. So put in a closed suction drain little hole right there and then tack that up and then just close sub Q and scan intradermal. Okay. We're happy to do that. Do you want to do it? Um, well, Tom, unfortunately that wire collet was labeled incorrectly. That was a pin collet. Someone did the other. Just let you guys have a look again at what we've got here. Yes. So that's the inside of the orbit there. That's the inside of the nasal nasal bone right there that's the max the maxilla hard palate gingiva on the hard palate the molars zygomatic arch there and that's the tumor all encased within that area there so that's kind of cool all right i'm going to leave jeff to take over you all right jeff yep. i'm just make sure that we don't we've got a little hole here see that yeah, in just the, in the, the pump there. Yeah, so we'll just have to close that primarily as well. I'll do that on the other side. Great. Okay, so I'm just going to come over and make sure that we've answered all our questions. You're totally okay, Jeff? Yeah, and then um, we'll go through a plan. Um, I am going to leave the hemostatic sponge in the wound because that will help create a seal uh, uh, to the nasal cavity. All right, so that's pretty much it. I'll just let you keep watching Jeff for a little bit while I do the plan.
Uh, Jeff, do you know if there's a discharge plan specifically for maxillectomies or? Yeah, so just a mass, mass removal. Yeah. Uh, just shows my mass removal. Now I'm going to go ahead and uh, open this up so you can see what our plans look like. I'll switch over to. All right. So, um, so this is a template that comes up um, automatically in our computer if we pull it up. So. Lucas will remain in the hospital overnight for monitoring and pain relief post-surgery. Lucas will apply two weeks of exercise restriction. While the surgery site to heal, heal will keep an e-call in place for two weeks. The mass was submitted for histopathology. Now we're going to discharge. Um, and it'll come up forwards on their end. Yeah, it's reversed because as if you were doing a selfie. You'd want to, yeah. Um, now, do you know if this dog was on meloxicam or carprofen? I recall it being on carprofen. I think I'll leave it on that. So we'll delete the meloxicam. Get rid of paracetamol. Get rid of codeine. And we'll put a fentanyl patch on it, okay? Um, Autumn, yeah. recheck in seven to 14 days. Overnight, we're gonna TPR every four hours. Walk it every four hours. We will do a repeated Hexavolume and total protein um, uh, immediately post op and at 8 p.m. We'll have it on maintenance. Does it need, is it still on a bolus? Uh, no, it's just got a small one. Okay. What's its blood pressure now? Um, so we can see. Okay. Um, we'll give it another bolus, I think. And I'll put it on twice maintenance fluids to um, reassess. Reassess um, cardiopulmonary status in four hours. Okay, and then in the hospital, we're going to stay on. Is it on a fentanyl CRI? No. No, okay, so we'll just go. Uh, uh, sorry, methadone will stay on carprofen in house. Get rid of paracetamol. We'll feed it soft food. And then we'll administer methivacaine through. Um, Drain and what's the dose that we use for mepivacaine? Uh, yeah, it's uh, two milligrams per kilogram diluted 50 50 with saline every four hours. Yeah, four six. Four to six hours. Okay, so that's pretty much that. Bounce you back to. Jeff suturing. So we're just closing where that the campus was attached, the medial campus was attached to the skull. We had to remove that area. And so it just created a little hole where the nasolacrimal ducts originate. Uh, question about this, the type of cancer in a six-year-old dog. Yes, that is quite normal. Um, if you had dirty margins, would a closed suction unit also increase the area needed for recut? Yes, it would, but I don't think a recut would be possible in this area anyway. So if we did get a dirty margin, I think we'd be thinking about either radiation therapy or metronomic chemotherapy. Uh, the sponge that we use is gel foam. Um, and that's pretty much it. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and end the stream. Um, James, uh, sorry, um, Jeff is just gonna do a sub Q closure and then intradermal. So that should be pretty straightforward. And we will see you again soon. Thanks again for watching. Happy New Year. And um, we'll talk to you again later.